Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Watching the news is a very tempting thing. It's like seeing a wreck on the freeway. You don't want to look. You know it's not going to be pleasant, but you just can't turn away. And so in the mornings when I get up and throughout the day I will check the news and it's never pleasant. Watch the news and you'll see all about how the COVID-19 coronavirus is still raging all around the country with ever increasing infection rates and no end in sight. You read and hear about systematic racism and social injustice, things that should be protested. Yet at the same time, we hear about protests turning violent, being just as evil as that which they are condemning. We still hear about drug dealers peddling their poison to children, people around the globe who are starving, natural disasters, around the planet and innocent people getting sick and dying. Life is not fair. Now as a pastor I have seen people go through some of the worst experiences and the most difficult hardships that anyone in this world could experience. Things that would cause the average person to crumble. I have seen people in the midst of absolute chaos in their lives. Yet these people lived through the cruelty of life. They know that life isn't fair. I know that life isn't fair. Yet the lessons I have learned from life teach me more than that. Perhaps you also have learned that life is not fair. Maybe you had that lesson when a spouse walked out the door, or at the cemetery where you stood at the grave of a loved one, the night before a difficult surgery took place, or the day when your finances came unraveled. Maybe you're like the psalmist, who in Psalm 13 said, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? David, the writer of that psalm, could certainly attest that life is not fair. And if you think that your life is not fair, let's take a look at the Bible. Because I'm sure that there were people in our holy book who must have lived blessed and happy lives. Oh wait. Genesis, Joseph, in the book of Genesis, was sold into slavery by his brothers. Job lost everything in a single day. John the Baptist was executed for no legitimate reason. And the apostles were beaten, tortured, and killed for proclaiming the gospel. Wait, I'll bet St. Paul must have lived a happy life. We know that's not true for him either. In fact, in his second letter to the church in Corinth, he writes in chapter 11, verses 24 to 26, a laundry list of challenges he's faced. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. 
I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. Anyone who says that the Christian life is a bed of roses is either naive or foolish. The fact is that even for people of faith, life is not fair. Jesus said that God causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust alike, and that he sends rain to both the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus would tell you that life is not fair. Jesus came into this world, and John's Gospel records for us that Jesus was rejected by his own people. He was given the mockery of a trial and sentenced to death. He was severely beaten, scourged. Roman soldiers mocked him, beat him more, and put a crown of thorns on his head before placing him on a cross to be crucified. Jesus' life was not fair. However, on the third day after Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God, death could not hold him. The power of the devil could not hold him. It may be that on Friday afternoon, Satan thought he had won a victory and had defeated Jesus, only to discover on Sunday morning that there was a power even greater that could bring Jesus back to life. In the comic strip Peanuts, one of the characters, Linus, has a blanket that he carries for security. I don't know how many of us had a security blanket. Mom, I don't remember if I had one or not. I think my brother did. I think my security blanket was my baseball glove. But there are people who even today carry security blankets. Things that symbolically give them security. It could be family or familiar routine that they follow every day. Bank accounts, good health, pension programs, or lots of friends. All kinds of grown-up security blankets that we clutch tightly when things get tough and when life is not fair. We spend time, money, and energy trying to find some kind of anchor for our lives, something that will give us stability through the storms of life, something that will sustain and support us when times get rough. In our second lesson this morning, St. Paul, in the eighth chapter of his letter to the Romans, describes for us our security blanket. Now there is so much in those few verses I could preach for a month and not cover it all. But I do want to focus on Paul's phrase at the end of that section where he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is our security blanket. That is how we cope when life is not fair. In fact, we do more than cope. We prosper. And there's a couple of points I want to make about this. The first 
we read in verses 26 and 27, that we have help when we need it. God has given to us His Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us that the Spirit itself intercedes for us, helps us to pray when we sometimes don't even know what to pray. Now we've all gone through circumstances where we've prayed and we've worried about whether or not we were saying the right prayers or whether what we were praying was being prayed appropriately. There are those who think that there's a magic formula to prayers. It doesn't matter what you ask, as long as you close it with, in Jesus' name, God's going to hear and give his approval. What Paul is telling us is that the nature and the essence of our prayers is that we can express to God whatever we are thinking or feeling. Now, it hurts me as an English teacher to say, your prayers don't even have to be grammatically correct. They just need to be genuine. Because God's Spirit will be there to help you pray and will, in fact, speak on your behalf. Secondly, in verse 28, Paul tells us that we're going to have a happy ending. Now, keep in mind, this is not a Disney movie where people live happily ever after. But Paul does say that all things God works for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. What a promise. What an assurance. No matter what is happening in our life, God will be able to use it as a blessing for us. Even the junk, even the awful experiences in our life. This is not some mental Jedi mind trick where illness or death or pain is somehow perceived as wonderful. This is not a drug-induced euphoria. When life stinks, we can say, my life stinks. When something awful happens, we can say, that's awful. But God is still active. And God is able from the disasters of our lives to bring growth and strength for us. Because this is the same God who's been faithful throughout the centuries. It's the same God who has worked throughout human history. It's the same God who revealed his love for us in Jesus Christ. We heard Paul say earlier, while we were still sinners, at the right time, Christ died for us. And elsewhere, Christ died for us while we were still God's enemies. Now hear that. Paul is not making some Pollyanna claim that enables us to ignore the realities of pain and suffering in our world. They do exist. But they exist within the context of God's kingdom. Secondly, we need to realize that we will not always see or comprehend at that time how God is going to help us. Many years ago when I was serving a church in Michigan, there was someone in our congregation who had been born with Down syndrome. He was never going to be able to live independently. And his mom didn't want to put him in a group home, so she kept him home with her and she took care of him. And everybody wagged their heads and spoke about how terrible it was that this boy had been born this way. I even remember somebody calling him mentally defective. And people bemoaned the fact that this woman had chosen to give up her own life 
to care for her son. But then in her later years, when she was stricken with arthritis and could not care for herself, she would have been all alone if it were not for her son, Harold, who stayed with her and now reversed the process and took care of his mother. Now, it would be a stretch to say that God caused Harold to be born with Down syndrome so that 55 years later he could care for his mother. No, unfortunately, we live in a world where some people have birth defects. That's just a part of life. But God saw what he could do with that situation. And even though it took decades, God brought goodness out of it. And all things worked for good. Because you see, God is playing with a stacked deck. We hear that in verses 31 to 35. Where Paul asks, what then shall we say in response to these things, these tragedies? What do we say when life is not fair? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. So who is there to condemn? No. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God also interceding for us. Who shall separate us? from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, the sword? If God is for us, who can be against us? We're inseparable from God. Nothing can keep us from him. And so when the tough times come, we can cling to God, and hold on to him, because God is going to cling to us and hold on to us. One of the silliest things I've ever seen is a timid Christian who's worried about the future or our circumstances or what might happen to us. We have no idea what's going to happen with this virus. We have no idea how long the pandemic is going to last. We have no idea how long the unrest is going to last in our cities, or when we as a church will finally stand up and address systemic racism. But we have the assurance that God loves us, and that God is with us, and that nothing can separate us from God. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.